Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Honoring a hero, a day full of grief and emotions as friends, family, and even strangers pay their respects to Sergeant Colin Rose. Guy? For a statewide recount in the presidential race, how can it be fast enough? Can it be fair enough? And how much will it cost? All right, Guy, but we're going to begin with new developments in a story we've been following all day. Shots fired at Detroit police officers. The manhunt is on to find the people who were pulling the triggers. Good to have you with us today here at 5. Detroit Police Chief James Craig calling it an ambush, but luckily the officers who were targeted were not hit. They were on routine patrol on Remington and Derby. That's right near John R. when those shots were fired. Jason Colthorpe has been following this for us. Let's bring him in now live with more on what we know. Jason. Devin, let me give you an idea of this manhunt that was going on here today. We're talking about a pretty big area when you talk about from the state fairgrounds back here down to eight mile this way. You've got John R and then state fair this way. We're talking about maybe a quarter to a half square mile police going door to door looking for these suspects, eventually focusing on the houses behind me and in this street, lots of shells and of course in really a once proud neighborhood that is now home to rival drug gangs, prostitution, and parents who are afraid to let their kids even walk to school. It was a routine patrol around 10 this morning at Remington and Derby when officers heard eight to 10 shots. Officers felt they were under fire, although no bullets hit their car. Chief James Craig called it an ambush. As the officers came into the view of the suspect, he took it upon himself to start firing at the officers. For hours, heavily armed officers searched homes over several blocks without finding the three suspects. DPD now interested in identifying this man seen running and the silver car in the foreground. Police did recover an AK-47 from a vacant home on Exeter they believe was the weapon used. They are also going over this surveillance video from another home on Exeter that captured a man on a bike shortly after the shooting and just before backup rolled past. That's normal over here. Normal is shots fired. Many neighbors I spoke with say shots fired at cops is not. Kelly Hines, though, who's lived here her 47 years, disagrees with that. She also thinks things could change with more police presence. It's the way of life. I mean, what else can you do? They'd be better if they did more. Why can't they be like this when some other stuff goes on in the neighborhood? We don't have several deaths over here and we ain't had half of this. And she's referring to, of course, the number of police officers that had this area covered. Again, they left this area about 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, right now, no arrests made regarding that. They did take a few people into custody today, mostly for vagrancy and drug charges. But again, the people they're looking for that fired these shots have not been found. We're in Detroit tonight. Jason Coulter of Local 4. But Jason, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually close to where the anti-police graffiti was found, right? Right around the corner, as a matter of fact, Devin, yep. we're about a block up and over. And that graffiti, if you remember, said, kill Detroit police officers, kill James Craig specifically. Yep. And we talked to the chief about that, and he said, you know, this plays into that narrative. But again, we should also say there is a suspect in custody for the graffiti, and sources tell me he's not connected right. to what happened today yep. at all. But uh, again, it just goes to that anti-police rhetoric that we're seeing nationwide as well. It feels Devin. that way. All right, Jason. Kim? Well, this is just one of the hundreds of very moving images we are seeing today at Ford Field. Friends, family, and so many other officers paying tribute to the life of Sergeant Colin Rose. Rose was posthumously promoted last night by Wayne State's police chief. And as you can see, this man was truly respected and loved. Sean Lay is live outside Ford Field tonight. And Sean, just a, a real heartbreaking day. And Kimberly, we're talking about Jason's report there of Detroit officers being fired on today. Now we're talking about a visitation here for this man right here. We've got the hearse coming out with the lights on. Colin Rose, Sergeant Colin Rose, Wayne State Police Officer, gunned down in the line of duty, doing his job last week, shot and killed. And we've got his visitation here all day long outside Ford Field. Now people with their hands over their hearts outside Ford, Ford Field, standing out of tension here for a incredibly emotional day inside a football stadium. And now you have people at attention giving him a salute as his funeral now is tomorrow. This day got off to an incredibly emotional start 
with canine officers. Remember, Colin Rose was a canine officer, a decorated and well-respected canine officer. We had so many canine officers coming here to pay respects that people were telling us that they watched uh, this procession of canine officers arrive here at the stadium, and they had tears in their eyes watching those officers honor Colin Rose. Take a look. The procession of canines was stunning. Wayne State's chief truly touched. We, we have them here from the city of New, from the state of New York uh, to, to all over. I, how many, I don't know. Sergeant Rose's family arriving to hugs and support on this very difficult day. No parent is meant to bury their son. Even they didn't know about their hearing dangers in this job, uh, they don't see this. At the front of the line of canine officers and their canine partners, Sergeant Rose's canine partner, Wolverine. It was clear that Wolverine was anxious. Well, you know, honestly, I've never seen I've never seen him do that. He was he was actually trembling. Wayne State Officer Andy Grimm is with Wolverine now and says Wolverine did not want to walk to Sergeant Rose's casket inside. When I got to the casket, I tried to get him to face the casket, but he wouldn't. So I just picked him up and held him. He actually calms down when you hold him. He's there is true heartbreak here, heartbreak for Colin Rose, his family, his fiance and his partner. There is heartbreak for Detroit. Three officers lost in just weeks. Every parent understands. I mean, got kids uh, that age myself and it's it's just a devastating situation because there's individuals out there who are embracing anti-police rhetoric that I believe it's fueling the attacks on our men and women in uniform and as for Wolverine I'm gonna do my best to keep him busy with work and training and stuff and just you know just be there to bond with him and uh, that's about all I can do you know right buddy Back here live outside Ford Field. Take a look at the scene about an hour ago. Hundreds, and we mean hundreds of Wayne State University students now arriving at Ford Field to pay their respects to Sergeant Colin Rose. Kimberly, back to you. Sounds like a very uh, touching tribute today, Sean. I know uh, you mentioned Wolverine, uh, the K-9 that Officer Rose had. He actually had two dogs. Do you know anything about that other dog? What happened to it? Yeah, sure. Clyde is his other K-9. He never went anywhere without a Wolverine or Clyde. Clyde is going to be retired, and he is with his uh, 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 Sergeant Rose's fiance and family, so he's going to be home with him while Wolverine will uh, bond and train with another officer who we met today and will continue on working with the Wayne State Police Department. Mm -hmm. And our thoughts and prayers with his family and with Wolverine tonight. Absolutely. Sean, we appreciate it. All right, uh, well, it's official. Green Party candidate Jill Stein has filed for a recount of the presidential vote here in the state of Michigan. Exactly. It's the first time it's ever happened in our state. A request filed this afternoon in Lansing. Donald Trump won the state, but of course by a very narrow margin. In fact, let's look at those numbers. 10,704 votes separating the two, the president-elect and Hillary Clinton. And now the state will see if that number holds up. Guy Gordon live from Lansing. Uh, but Guy, we talked about this yesterday, the enormity of counting all the votes in such a short period of time. 4.8 million by hand, 83 county clerks in charge of 83 different recounts, and in most cases, they only have 11 days to do it, where previous recounts have taken two to three weeks. Yes, it is a tall order. The Green Party today offering no hard evidence, but saying they have what they call indicators. Uh, in the meantime, uh, they are targeting only states where Donald Trump, they were tipping point states, but they still insist in spite of that, that this isn't about overturning the election, that it's about restoring integrity to the process. We filed. Stein claims in her petition she was, quote, aggrieved on account of fraud or mistake in the canvas of votes. The mistake? 75,000 so-called undervotes. Ballots where optical scan machines recorded no vote for president. Yeah, she claims uh, they may have missed people. them. That's nearly double the number that it was in 2012. And it raises real and legitimate concerns about this election. This U of M cybersecurity expert says optical scan machines like Michigan's have been hacked before in research. But what's the likelihood this will be a game changer? You know, I think we're going to find anomalies. Whether those anomalies are enough to change the result, I think probably not. Michigan Republicans in the Trump campaign call it an outrage and are reviewing the recount petition and considering grounds for formal objection.
a machine count does make more sense. It is actually more accurate. A hand count leaves more room for human error and a hand count will take significantly longer. The Secretary of State says the actual cost could be five times higher than the nearly $1 million posted by the Stein campaign this afternoon. She's cautiously hopeful that they can meet that December 13th deadline. It's going to take uh, everyone rowing the boat together to try to get this done. It will be very difficult. It is a time crunch. Now, we asked the Stein campaign if, if it's fair to stick Michigan taxpayers with a $4 million bill uh, for this recount, they seemed, seemed to leave the door open to paying those overcharges. That when I talked to Jill Stein by phone earlier this morning, she said no, just the statutory max. Uh, we also asked if this will be fair and honest. Both sides say yes. They think and are confident that this will be a fair recount, that the Republicans say they don't believe that it's fair to taxpayers. We're live from Lansing. I'm Guy Gordon, local for Kimberly and Devin. Back to you. Well, Guy, take us to the timeline now. We kind of waited for this announcement, and then the meter starts running here pretty quickly. Well, it really depends upon uh, the Donald Trump campaign at this point. If they file an objection, uh, that could push things back for a few days. Yeah. If they don't, the county gets started bright and early Friday morning in Oakland and Kent County over in Grand Rapids. At uh, 930, there will be a canvassers meeting to handle any objection. If there is one, counting won't start in Wayne and Macomb until Saturday morning. And then it is day all day, all night through the weekends until they get this done. And it will be tough. Pretty extraordinary times. All right, guy. Uh, let's get over to Hank now for a look at what's ahead today. Hank? That could affect people here in Detroit. A battle in Lansing over who picks up the tab for flooding damage at your home. We'll explain in my Help Me Hank report new tonight. Okay, Hank, and Dan Gilbert is on a roll. New tonight, a first look at the plan for this vacant block downtown. And let's just say it isn't <laughs> small. Hi, Ben. Hey, Kim, not a ton of rain showing up on 4 Live Radar, but there are some sprinkles out there in the far east side. Temperatures continuing to drop. We'll show you what the first day of December looks like next. The man who admitted to killing a four-year-old and her mother and then dumping their bodies in a vacant home pled guilty. But he also had a reason. He said this all could have been avoided. And with the right medication and treatment for my problems, these crimes may have been prevented. More from Marcus Hightower and from the families of Heidi Walker and four-year-old Savannah, who are trying to go on without them. It's the new at six. This shocking video first seen here last night at 11, new at six. You're going to hear from the woman who took this punch from a road rager. Also helping himself to donations meant to help cash strap students make it through college. What police know about him and how you can help find him at six o'clock. A man was sentenced today after admitting to killing a mother and her four year old daughter. Uh, you'll no doubt recall the case. Heidi Walker and four year old Savannah were reported missing and then were found dead in the basement of a vacant home. As Nick Monticelli shows us, Marcus Hightower is going to spend a very long time behind bars. She's four, you know, I mean, she was a happy kid, you know, she would, you know, do whatever. I mean, I don't know, you know, she's needed to enjoy a, a pure and good life. This is the face many of us cannot forget. After four-year-old Savannah and her mom, Heidi Walker, were murdered early this year. People versus Marcus Hightower. 34-year-old Marcus Hightower pled guilty to killing them, stabbing Heidi because of an argument. All of this happening in February of this year. Both went missing. An Amber Alert was sent out, but unfortunately, mom and daughter were found dead, burned in the basement of a vacant home in Detroit. Hightower was dating Heidi at the time. He was sentenced to 50 to 75 years in prison, but he says this could have been avoided if he was properly diagnosed with bipolar disorder. With the right medication and treatment for my problems, these crimes may have been prevented. However, I accept full responsibility for my crimes. Outside of court, his brother Gerard agreed. Yeah, because we kept, we kept getting in fights and stuff all the time. Yeah, I knew something was wrong with it. But Heidi's sister Holly says it does not and should not matter. There's a lot of people that have types of mental illness that don't commit acts like he did. More so, she says his sentence of 50 to 75 years isn't enough. No, I think he should get out life. I don't think he should be eligible for parole in 50 years. 
but that doesn't mean he's going to get out. Hightower also pled guilty to intentionally setting the fire inside of that basement. That's an arson charge. He'll serve six to 10 years concurrently, meaning he'll serve that time while he is serving his time for the murders. At the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Uh, interesting note here because Hightower pleaded guilty to second degree murder, not first. Uh, that means an appeal is not automatic. He can still file one, though, within 42 days. Oh, we just saw Nick Monticelli outside. We saw Guy Gordon outside. Yes. Neither of them Absent were wearing coats. Coats, yes. <laughs> exactly. The last day of November here Crazy we're talking stuff. about. That will be changing quickly <laughs> okay. uh, tomorrow. First and day. I'm glad we noted it now. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> when we flip the calendar, Mother Nature is going to bring in those normal temperatures fairly quickly behind that. In fact, the cold front is actually going to change everything. It's actually slid through already. The only spot still holding on to the 50s here on the east side. Port here on 52, 54 in Mount Clemens. Everybody else is in the 40s as that cold air continues to spill in from the west. And so far, uh, now that we're closing the books here on November, uh, this has been a pretty easy start to winter. We are going, if, if things sort of stay the way they are right now today, fifth warmest November on record. Our morning low was 42. That's the only thing we're still waiting on. If we happen to drop below that later tonight before midnight, that could change that number. But as of right now, it is the fifth warmest November on record here in Detroit. Here's where the showers are and they are on the far east side, so not very many of us are seeing those, but that 75 stretch down river and through Monroe County is getting wet. Couple sprinkles maybe showing up here right in the city center and a few more up in Mount Clements or north of Mount Clements in Macomb County. Other than that, the rest of us just clouds and cool temperatures tonight, but the breezes start picking up as we get into tomorrow. Those winds coming off the lake, they will bring some lake effect showers and maybe a few snowflakes, mostly to the west side of the state. There's a chance, especially in the afternoon, a couple of those could get here. They would be liquid by that point. Anything that does show up is going to be extremely light. There's not a lot of moisture for this to work with, but the winds are going to be noticeable. So temperatures going down, plus those winds, we're talking wind chills that are going to make things feel a whole lot different tomorrow than what we're seeing out there right now. 36 tonight for the overnight low. A couple drops, maybe a flake at times, but again, most of us are going to stay dry. This is one of those days in the four zone forecast where there's not going to be a whole lot of difference with temperatures tomorrow. They're going to be right in the low 40s pretty much everywhere. Warmest temperatures around Detroit at 42 coldest temperatures around 40 and you'll see those in the north zone, but just about everybody south of Michigan Avenue at 41 tomorrow, 40 and 41 generally here in our west zone and then in our north zone, at least they'll be in the 40s. Uh, we're not seeing 30s for highs just yet. Those may start to show up as we get a little bit later in the five or seven day forecast. 41 again on Friday, 43 on Saturday. That stretch from Friday through most of Sunday is looking dry, but Sunday late we will see a mix of rain and snow and that's probably going to be our biggest weather maker, at least in the short term. So here we go with winter. But back to 50 there before too long again. So yeah, we're, just we're a little right. bit of a spike. Yeah. Here we go with December, I should say. I don't <laughs> yeah. want to rush winter in here just yet. <laughs> so got about three or four more, a few weeks. more weeks. All right, all right, Ben, thank you. Well, food labels say natural flavors, but how natural are they? Ahead in good health, the new warning from nutritionists about some of your favorite foods. We'll have that here tank. You know, harder for you to take legal action after a flood. That's the argument being made by some in Lansing. What you need to know after the break. Action taken by lawmakers in Lansing could make it harder for you to collect damages after a flood. At least uh, that's the argument from opponents of the new bill that just passed the House today. It has a lot of people worried, especially if they've already experienced some flooding damage. So let's bring yeah. in consumer investigator Hank Winchester with more on this, Hank. And we know a lot of people had damage in Detroit this summer from flooding. They're going to be OK. We'll explain it to you here in a minute. Uh, let's take a look at that bill because it is something that has a lot of people talking, especially here in Metro Detroit. Uh, the information that we're talking about is House Bill 5282. It did pass the House late this afternoon. The focus is on flooding and the amount of rain that would have to be determined in order for you to take legal action. Now we have some more information. The concern is that some believe it will only make it harder for homeowners to sue if they have damage after a flood. Supporters say, though, that is just not the case with this particular bill. As you can see, uh, the concern is about any current lawsuits. Supporters claiming that the bill focuses on 
rainfall events. That means a significant amount of rain within a short time. Now, many in Metro Detroit, specifically here in the city, they filed claims uh, this summer uh, because of concerns of flooding, especially those uh, near the Gross Point border. Uh, we are being told that those people will not be affected at all. Uh, this is now heading to the Senate. If it does pass, it will then go to the governor. We'll keep you posted on this one. For now, Devin Kimberly, back to you. Yeah, interesting. You still got so many people uh, trying to clean up after that one in Gross Point. Exactly. And a lot of bitter, the the bitter folks about it, too. All right, Hank. Well, the Detroit Medical Center is set to lay off about 1% of its total staff. The hospital has reportedly notified its 12,000 employees of the news. The layoffs will see 60 employees and managers being let go, and about 40 unfilled positions will stay that way. The move is expected to help DMC save about $17 million in, in expenses. New at 530. A firestorm rages. Resort towns reduced to rubble as people in the Smoky Mountains get their first look at the destruction. Cutting ties, President-elect Trump makes a critical move ahead of the inauguration. Detroit's comeback focused on downtown yet again. It's a huge development, but not without controversy. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 530 starts now. Building up, Dan Gilbert is on a roll, and now we're getting a look at his second massive development plan for the city in as many days. Dan Gilbert's massive Detroit real estate portfolio is set to get even bigger. Uh, think of it as a game of Monopoly. He's basically buying every square he lands on. And yesterday, it was new apartments in Brush Park. Today, it is this. Plans for a vacant stretch of Monroe Street downtown. It will appropriately be called the Monroe Blocks. Sean Lay was at today's Downtown Development Authority meeting, and that's where we got our first look at what is coming, Sean, and it's enormous. It is. You're right about that, Devin. And let's talk to you about what this project really means to people. If you're a business looking to move downtown, this may be right for you. If you're an individual looking to move downtown, you may want to look into this if it does come to fruition. But let's make this clear also. This project comes with controversy. There is no Class A large plate office buildings left for people to lease, period. The focus of Detroit's comeback remains downtown. And this next big project hangs on the passage of state tax incentives now in front of lawmakers in Lansing. The city must approve selling off three sites for $2.7 million plus one additional dollar. Uh, Bedrock right, development. Six Dan six Gilbert's team uh, gets prime property to develop with a price tag that is not yet known but thought to be more than $100 million. It's all about bringing more people downtown. Oh, but even more, more the better, right? So we're bringing more people downtown, whether it be for you know residential, retail, um, office space, right? All these things are drawing people downtown and then creating more jobs. This is new construction. Bedrock says it can fill a new 20-story office tower. Phase two will be European-style living and retail. It is not without controversy. Albert Kahn's 105-year-old National Theater left to rot, now part of this project. There's talk of keeping the facade of the theater, yet rendering show just keeping an arch of the historic building. We worked again with uh, the DDA and folks, and we uh, committed to saving the facade. And I think that is really important, really excited about it. Um, I think it's, a, we, th we think, and I think many people believe it's a jewel. So that is, uh, that's what we're committed to do. Back here live, it's a jewel on a historic registry that is one step closer to meeting a wrecking ball now with today's vote. Here's the deal. You're talking about the National Theater, uh, city owned until today, uh, until council approve, approves it, but it's been sitting and rotting since the 1970s. It was an adult theater, so no one's really cared for it, but now people care for it, that it could be meeting a wrecking ball. So here's why people are caring for it. You're talking about a past manager, Devin, Bud Abbott from Abbott and Costello. He managed the place in the 1920s, so it's an important place. There's going to be has to be some more dialogue about how how what's going to happen to pres preserving it, what that preservation really means. Bud Abbott, it's, it's 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 that's wild to contemplate. Bud Abbott being involved, right? Uh, Bud us, Abbott. Yeah, right. I know. Now tell us a little bit about uh, <laughs> uh, the schedule. Where uh, what's the layout? How, when do we start to see things happen? 
Okay, so uh, 2017 is all planning for all this, and then 2018, if everything goes correctly, you're going to see a rapid uh, shovels in the ground and rapid development, rapid building of this. Uh, but if the state doesn't approve these tax incentives that Bedrock is looking for, you're going to see a much smaller plan. Ah, ah, well, it is a statement piece, as you see from the drawings. All right, Sean. Right. Karen. Right now, historic wildfires continue to rage through eastern Tennessee. So far, four people are dead. Thousands of others have been forced out of their homes. The fires are leveling parts of two popular resort towns. NBC's Sarah Rosario is in Pigeon Forge tonight, where prayers for rain were finally answered. Rain moving through this area is helping some, but it's not doing anything for the buildings and homes like this one burned to the ground. Many of these people literally ran for their lives. They're now in shelters, but they have no idea when they'll be able to go home or if they'll even have one. In the gateway to the Smoky Mountains, home to popular tourist destinations, a historic wildfire reducing homes and buildings to rubble is finally letting up. I mean, it was literally like driving through hell. The largest fire for the volunteer state in more than 100 years, leaving four dead and several missing. Watch as we drive past. You're going to see a huge flame right here. This is Tammy Lang and her husband are among more than 14,000 forced to leave, rushing to get to safety through ash and smoke. And all you could think is we got out, but we're, we're going to die. Now safe in a shelter, they're anxious to know the status of their home. Sadly, Jerry and Jeff Morgan already learned theirs. That was our big, beautiful stone wall. Recently okay. remodeling their Pigeon Forge house, parts are now burned beyond recognition. My mom and grandmother's wedding dress and our pictures. My mom's hope chest. With the prospect of starting over now top of mind, <sighs> others are still in harm's way. More than 200 firefighters are taking the brunt of the blaze, but with eight new fires overnight and storms toppling trees and power lines, their jobs are becoming increasingly difficult. We are experiencing some small mudslides and rock slides. Meantime, the community is coming together, preparing for another night of uncertainty, hoping to go home soon. And this wildfire has a huge impact on the economy, which is primarily driven by tourism. More than 11 million people visit this region per year. Meantime, local officials are trying to figure out what started this fire. They're not ruling out arson. Reporting in Pigeon Forge, Sarah Rosario, Local 4. All right, thank you, Sarah. Now, yesterday, Ben highlighted a growing severe weather threat that was down south. Uh, I wish that forecast was wrong, but you were on the money, unfortunately. Un yeah, unfortunately, but, you know, tornadoes are obviously deadly, but when they happen at night, they can be especially, yeah. and this is what uh, people in Alabama found out last night. Five people lost their lives last night. In addition to that, there were three people, three adults and three children who were injured at a daycare facility in Alabama. What were they doing there at night? Well, they were living in a mobile home. They left that to take shelter in the daycare, and then the daycare got hammered by a tornado. So they were following uh, uh, the advice of what we tell people to do all the time is to get out of a mobile home park, but this uh, did not work out. The three adults listed in critical condition today at an area hospital, 25 homes and several other structures damaged, according to county officials, uh, with the, uh, those tornadoes last night. Look at the map from yesterday about how much of the south got hit with those severe storms. These are all the st uh, severe thunderstorm reports over the last 24 hours. And when we highlight just the tornado reports, well over a dozen. Some of those have just come in on uh, Cobb County outside of Atlanta, where they had multiple reports of tornadoes uh, that are still or were ongoing uh, earlier this afternoon. So just a deadly day, deadly night and day across the south. Karen. All right, thank you very much. The Wayne County Road Team is gearing up for winter weather. This afternoon, the DPS Executive Team and Wayne County Executive Warren Evans spoke about Wayne County's snow and ice preparedness efforts. We've gotten some, uh, the guys are telling me, state-of-the-art uh, trucks that have a wider blade, um, are great trucks for plowing. We've got six of those. We've got additional trucks that will haul away the snow that... Uh, you know, you're shoveling and getting out of uh, other places. So we're trying to stay up with what's necessary to provide the level of service in Wayne County that we think people deserve. Wayne County is also hiring public service maintenance workers and equipment repair specialists. Contact Wayne County Human Resources for more information. 
President-elect Trump is taking a victory lap of sorts tomorrow. He's going to go to Indiana to celebrate Carrier's decision to keep about 1,000 jobs in the United States and Ohio to thank voters there. Brian Moore has more on that and more news that Trump revealed on Twitter. Brian. Thanks, Devin. The president-elect has notably snubbed the media in recent months, but a news conference in a little more than two weeks will be an important opportunity to talk about some critical issues. In his latest Twitter blast, President-elect Trump announced he'll hold a news conference with his family in two weeks. He'll outline plans to get out of his business and focus on running the country. The question, will he divest from a global empire synonymous with his name? Number one, can he actually do it? Number two, does he have it in him to do it? I mean, this is the guy who's tweeting at 3 a.m. He hasn't held a news conference since late July, and his all-important cabinet announcements have been revealed online. Among the latest, former Goldman Sachs executive Steven Mnuchin as Treasury Secretary. He says tax reform is priority number one. Making sure we repatriate trillions of dollars back to the United States. And the personal income taxes, where we're going to have the most significant middle income tax cut since Reagan. Also joining Team Trump, billionaire investor Wilbur Ross as Commerce Secretary. There's also news that Sarah Palin is angling for Secretary of Veterans Affairs. This bureaucracy is killing our vets. Trump also tweeted plans for an Indiana trip tomorrow to announce that Carrier Air Conditioning, a frequent target in his campaign speeches, won't be moving a thousand jobs to Mexico as it had planned. The president-elect's trip tomorrow also includes a rally in Cincinnati, first stop on a battleground thank you tour. In Washington, Brian Moore, Local 4. All right, Brian, other political news today. One more note, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi will remain the House Minority Leader. Today she won the race to lead the Democratic caucus for an eighth term. Across Michigan now this Wednesday, following stories from Muskegon Heights on the west side of the state, also from the Capitol in Lansing. But let's start right now in Bay City, and that's where investigators are saying a man found dead in this burned home on Thanksgiving Day was actually killed before the house caught fire. Police have identified the victim as 59-year-old Stephen Allen Booza. His death has been ruled a homicide. Police say this fire was set in an attempt to cover up his murder. No arrests have been made. A mother is now facing prison time after police said she was drunk when she crashed head on into a pickup with her two children with her. Uh, police say Rebecca Whirling struck the pickup after crossing a center line in Muskegon Heights. Police also said Whirling's two year old suffered a broken jaw and that Whirling's blood alcohol level was four times the legal limit. Just 23 years old, she's now facing two felony drunk driving charges and both of those charges carry a possible five years in prison. Governor Snyder has signed a new bill into law. Yes, it aims to limit the number of state-sponsored license plates, <laughs> like this Boy Scouts of America plate you see here. This plate was made by the state, then used by the Boy Scouts to raise money. Various colleges and organizations have these plates, but under the new bill, Michigan will make no more than 15 fundraising plates a year. Plates will also have to show strong sales to stay in production. Well, with winter on the way, we are assured it is. Uh, you've probably put the shorts away for now, but not this guy. New tonight, the ridiculous reason he refuses to wear pants and why he says it's going to stay that way for a while. Doc? Well, food labels may say natural flavors, but just how natural are the flavors in your favorite foods? The new warning from nutritionists next in Good Health. Coming up on Thursday on Local 4 News Today, believe it, tomorrow is the first day of December, so it's time to get your holiday shopping done. Yes, we're going to have the best items to buy in December. Plus, grab the hot glue gun. Find out why it could solve several of life's little annoyances. That's coming up during Thrifty Thursday at 5 a.m. And, of course, we have Brandon on weather, Kim on traffic, always on the force. Join us from 4.30 to 7 a.m. We'll see you Thursday morning. On Jeopardy! New at 6. The video couldn't be any more clear. It speaks volumes of the guy who snatched a donation jar from a local Taco Bell. This one's going to make you mad. Hi, hey, Paula. Also coming to downtown Detroit, a major auto supplier and hundreds of jobs. What it could mean for the city and the local economy. Now to good health, naturally flavored. 
naturally sounds better than artificially flavored, especially for people who are trying to eat healthier. But as Dr. Frank McGeorge explains to us, just because the word natural is used doesn't always mean it's better, right, Doc? Natural. No, it doesn't. You know, food labeling is regulated by the FDA, and use of the term natural has come under some scrutiny recently. The FDA generally allows use of the term natural on foods that do not contain anything artificial or synthetic. But the term naturally flavored, different thing altogether. You may have noticed that many foods and drinks list natural flavors on the ingredient label, but just how natural are they? Well, not very. Natural flavors differ from artificial flavors in that there is some naturally derived component to it, but how much or what exactly is a toss up? Even though they may take something that is naturally derived, it could have been a compound from um, an apple, for example, and not the actual apple. And then once they get that certain compound from whatever they're taking it from that's naturally derived, they then can um, alter and do things within a lab setting um, and still call it natural flavors. According to Kristen Kirkpatrick, a registered dietitian, natural flavors are one of the most prevalent ingredients in food products. But companies don't have to disclose what natural flavors are created from and that the information is often proprietary. For people looking for real fruit in a product, be sure the actual fruit is listed on the ingredient label. If you have concerns about the unknown element of natural flavors, it's worth going the extra mile to add whole foods to your dish or drink. If you truly want natural flavors, what I say is get it naturally. Um, if you want a naturally uh, flavored apple or blueberry or peach in a product, then just have the fruits and you don't have to worry about how it's been altered in any way. So just keep in mind that the term naturally flavored is really just there to help you identify when something is flavored, whether naturally or artificially. <laughs> and even if something is naturally flavored, the rest of the ingredients may be total garbage. Oh, well, that's true. The flavoring is natural. <laughs> yeah. The rest, who knows? Oh. You always put things in such good perspective. Just keep it in mind when you're reading <laughs> the label. Not everything natural is great either. <laughs> Arsenic. Oh. All poison, all natural. Hemlock. Mm -hmm. we'll exactly. Sure we can think of a few. Exactly. All right, Frank. Thanks. <laughs> Well, with the Green Bay Packers finally getting a, a win on Monday night, a Green Bay man can finally wear pants again. I kid you it not. It sounds strange, you it right. but that is true. Glenn Seffeld said he would only wear shorts, only shorts, until the green and gold came out on top. No matter what the thermostat says, there he is right there. Well, with their win over the Eagles, he's finally in the clear, but he says he's going to keep the act going. I decided. I think my shorts are good luck. I'm going to wear shorts as long as they keep winning now. You do that. Because <laughs> that he is says, the book. He says he actually prefers wearing shorts. He's thankful it hasn't gotten too cold yet. But that's... It's cold. It's a different breed. 